Well, like yourself, I live in Australia. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, I'm a sports and exercise medicine physician. So uh, my background in terms of medicine, uh, I started sort of, you know, conventional medical practice. And then very early on in the piece, I actually discovered low carbohydrate diets. And uh, I discovered the science in a, an editorial in the British Medical Journal. And at the time I was suffering metabolic syndrome. Uh, which, as you know, is defined by five features. And, you know, in particular, I had incredibly high blood pressure and I had very high triglycerides and my HDL level wasn't up to speed. And you only need three of the five criteria. I wasn't obese. I didn't have a abdominal adiposity. And as far as I know, I didn't have fasting, elevated fasting glucose, but I never tested that. But I certainly met the diagnostic criteria for having metabolic syndrome. And when I came across this editorial, I thought, well, you know, good grief, this can't be true. I mean, this totally contradicts everything that I learned in medical school. And I learned it in medical school, so it must be true. But the problem was, it was actually authored by two doctors and scientists whom I respect greatly. So Professor Timothy Noakes and Professor Peter Bruckner. And uh, I consider both of them friends now, um, which is, uh, you know, I'm incredibly grateful for that. But I sort of said, well, these guys aren't loonies. They're sort of doyens of sports medicine. And, you know, within our field, we, we understand it. it's not coming from a very good evidence base. So these guys have actually introduced a, a modicum of science to the whole process. So I went and had a look at the references and I thought, oh, <laughs> this might, there might be something there. So I sort of embarked upon a, a personal journey with quite frankly, fantastic results. And over time, and I think like with many people, and this is over more than 10 years, that initial low carbohydrate diet has morphed into various versions of ketogenic diets, paleolithic diets, and then tending towards, a, you know, basically a, a largely plant-free diet toward, tending towards carnivore diet. So it's been an interesting journey. Honestly, I can't remember, but probably for at least four years, five years, I've had very little vegetable matter. And it wasn't a conscious decision. It was almost hedonistic desires. When I say that, it's like I, I only wanted to eat things that I enjoyed eating and two, that didn't make me feel bad afterwards. And as it turned out, uh, I realized that, you know, when I would consume lots of collie rice and all of these low carb staples, um, it would, you know, it didn't agree with me. It didn't sit well. At yeah. least it didn't agree with my gastrointestinal tract. So I sort of ended up steering away from that. And, you know, every so often my wife would make a comment about, oh, you haven't eaten any veggies. And it's like, no, oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Thanks for putting it out. And even back then, I, I didn't really have any concerns about nutrient deficiencies because I knew enough about nutrition. I, I'd done enough reading to know that all the essential nutrients that we actually needed were able to be provided by my diet at the time. So in, a, in essence, I sort of stumbled on carnivore through hedonism. The list is too long. So number one, saturated fat won't kill you. Saturated fat uh, doesn't increase LDL. LDL for all intents and purposes, if it's undamaged, isn't inherently harmful. If you restrict salt intake the way the government or the advisory panels advise us to, then you could actually increase your chance of dying. Fibre is not an essential nutrient. In actual fact, it's an anti-nutrient. It's the opposite of a nutrient. The fact that it's not digested by definition means consuming fibre is akin to a malabsorption, maldigestion disorder. Uh, it just goes on and on. Seed oils, which have been promoted, polyunsaturated oils that have been promoted are healthy, uh, you know, are not necessarily so. It's not the fact that the seed oils are bad, the omega-6s are bad, but there's certain chemicals and constituents and oxidative properties within seed oils uh, that are bad. Well, the interesting thing about seed oils is that we've got research data that demonstrates their harm. Mm. But I guess that the problem has been we've had limited mechanistic understandings, or at least a widespread knowledge of the mechanistic understandings of their harm have not been well known. So it comes down to a couple of key things. So first of all, there's, a, I guess, there's a, a common view within the low carb sphere that omega-6 fats are inherently inflammatory. And because seed oils have abundant omega-6 fats, that's why they're harmful. 
And this has been born out of associational research where we have a look at the ratio of omega-6 and omega-3 fats within people's red blood cells and other tissues of their body. And we find that people with more omega-6 fats in their red blood cells do far worse on multiple parameters, uh, multiple autoimmune diseases, allergic diseases, so on and so forth, cardiovascular disease, inflammatory diseases, you name it. It's uh, having a high level of omega-6 fats in your cells is associated with adverse outcomes. But this is only associational. And I personally do not believe that it's an inherent property of omega-6 fats that is harmful. And I don't believe that's what's making seed oils harmful. So the, the fact remains that omega-6 fats are essential oils. Without them, we're not doing so good. That is the very definition of essential. So there's two key properties of seed oils that makes them harmful. So the first one is its tendency to oxidize. So the tendency to oxidize, it, it, it's akin to the chemical process of rusting. It's what happens when you have free radicals that rip electrons away from other molecules or atoms and they damage them. And if you do that to a fat or a, a protein within the body, that's going to uh, have deleterious outcomes. And we know that seed oils, by virtue of their chemical structure, these polyunsaturated bonds, where these double bonds between two adjacent carbon atoms, that is very, very reactive. We've also demonstrated that when you consume an oxidized oil, that gets incorporated into the lipoproteins of your body. Things like chylomicrons or what most people would have heard of, low density lipoprotein, what is called bad cholesterol, LDL. And then you've got circulating oxidation products. So think about it. If you've got an unhealthy diet, your LDL basically becomes a vehicle to carry oxidation around your circulation. So that's the connection between uh, oxidation and damage of your blood vessels. And LDL is basically the, the vehicle for that. So that's obviously not going to be a good thing. So oxidation is a component of seed oils, which is you know uh, harmful. But one thing that is not well understood, and that's something which I'm going to hope to promote a little bit more over the coming months, is something which I term fake plant cholesterol. You would have heard of plant sterols or, or phytosterol. Mm -hmm. um, and these, these chemicals, I, I think we can mount a very strong argument that they, they are absolutely deleterious to the human body. And they are in high concentration in seed oils and vegetable oils. They're in basically every plant food. So we get a not insignificant contribution to our, our phytosterol or fake plant cholesterol load from cereals by virtue of how much we eat. But on a gram for gram basis, seed oils provide us with the, with the most. Now, the thing is, this imitates cholesterol. And in some cases, the body can absorb it. But when it absorbs it, the body tries to do things with it that it would normally do, that it would normally use cholesterol for, but because of some molecular variation, very subtle molecular variation, it can't do it. So it basically leads to deficient functions of things that cholesterol is normally used for. Now, the irony is that we use these plant sterols to try and lower our body's lipoprotein levels. Because as you know, lipoproteins contain cholesterol. And if you can create defective cholesterol within the body, then it's going to have trouble synthesizing low density lipoprotein or synthesizing VLDL, very low density lipoprotein, which shrinks down into low density lipoprotein. So that, that's how these, our, our cholesterol levels, or you know, what we call our cholesterol levels, our lipoprotein levels are actually lowered with plant sterol. So we often use this therapeutically to lower people's cholesterol. Mm. But here's a question for you. If this is such a good thing, what would happen to somebody who would absorb an unusually large amount of these plant sterols? they must have very good cardiovascular health because it would lower their cholesterol and it would be very good for them. That if we follow this theory through to the logical conclusion, that's where we should be. If plant sterols are good because they lower your LDL, people who absorb more plant sterols would do better. And this is in the context of the fact that most of us will only absorb about 1% of the plant sterols we consume because our body is doing its damnedest to try not to absorb them. It's kicking them out. But if you consume a bucket load in seed oils, in a standard Western diet, then some is going to get through. So we only absorb about 1%, but some people absorb a lot more. They've got a, a genetic 
uh, change in their DNA that leads to just excess absorption of plant sterols. That condition is called cytosterolemia, S-I-T-O-S-T-E-R-O-L-A-E-M-I-A. -E -E um, but cytosterolemia is a condition, and I quote, that is associated with advanced, severe, premature atherosclerosis. Yeah. So these plant sterols, which we're giving people to prevent heart disease, if you just happen to absorb more of them than is normal, then you're probably going to die of a heart attack. Well, that's a bit odd. So, I mean, these are the kind of things that we should be looking at. We should be understanding biology. Everybody wants to throw up, oh, I've done this epidemiological study and I've done that epidemiological study, and they don't really have any basis for understanding root cause mechanisms. So basically a lot of what they say is biologically implausible. I'll, I'll, let's go on to, you know, for biologically implausibility, the next time, you know, somebody says, oh, you shouldn't eat saturated fat. Play a little game. Okay, so why shouldn't we eat saturated fat? Because it will raise your LDL and LDL is bad for you. Okay, great. How does it raise my LDL? And they won't have an answer. There is no known plausible biological mechanism, either demonstrated experimentally or even postulated, by which saturated fat increases LDL levels, low density lipoprotein levels. And that's going to shock a lot of people. And in actual fact, what it is, is that on a standard Western diet where you're consuming vegetable oils, the plant sterols are lowering. They're artificially lowering. They're taking your LDL level from a healthy, normal, physiological level, and they're lowering it. And all that happens if you remove the seed oils from the diet, you allow your LDL level to return to a normal physiological level. How about a study from British Medical Journal that looked at what happened when they supplemented people with different fats and they had a look at the impact on their LDL levels. So they used a coconut oil that was 96% saturated fat from memory. And the standard is about 92, but in this study, I believe from memory, it was 96% saturated fat. And they compared it with butter, which was only 66% saturated fat. So the people who consumed the butter, their LDL level went up moderate amount. What do you think happened to the people who consumed the coconut oil? 96% saturated fat given that, you know, we know <laughs> that saturated fat increases LDL. Yeah. Well, their LDL levels actually went down. Now, the interesting thing was there wasn't really much discussion about this in the paper. I actually had to go to one of the appendices to actually get the data. And when I saw it, I said, well, I can see why they're keeping quiet about that because I'm sure that's not the point they're wanting to make. Bigger, but I mean, if they were genuine scientists, that would have been the headline of the paper. You know, saturated fat does not, you know, 96% saturated fat in coconut oil lowers LDL. I mean, that's an important empirical observation that informs our understanding of science. And instead it's left to people like you and me to trawl through the papers and have a look at the appendices and the supplementary data to actually find where there's been a bit of mischievous reporting. Well, I mean, the, the interesting thing was that I came across that when the genesis of my lecture on fiber hmm. came about i was writing a chapter for a medical textbook hmm. on nutrition and as you know when you're doing writing an academic text everything needs to be referenced to the nth degree and i was low carb at this stage mm -hmm. um but i hadn't ever looked into the science of fiber so i got to fiber and said you know recommendations yes 30 grams of fiber a day is recommended for adults here's the reference i looked at it and said well that's an advisory statement you know what i think about advisory statements <laughs> not much yeah. it's like well let me go to the advisory statement and i'll see where their references were and i followed the chain back and it would always stop you could see an opinion but nowhere was the evidence actually cited. And I'm like, well, this is odd. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at research on fiber and there's a few things that are absolutely well known. So yes, it does increase the bulk of your feces. If you ingest something that the body can't absorb at all, then it's gonna to have to come out the other end. So your feces is gonna be larger, that, that's obvious. Um, it's an irritant 
and it can increase transit time. So things can travel through your intestines quicker. Yes, that is true. But when we actually looked at it in terms of symptoms of constipation, so as a doctor, you don't have somebody come to you and say, oh, doc, um, just over the last few months, my poops have been quite small. There's no pain or bloating, but they're just a bit small. Do you think you could just make them a bit bigger? <laughs> or, or you don't have anybody saying, you know, look, I, uh, I did a, a test and uh, it's taking uh, two and a half days for my contents to transit all the way through the gastrointestinal tract. Do you think you could speed that up 12 or 24 hours? I mean, people, people aren't aware of this. They have no symptoms. People care about pain. They care about bloating, complain about bleeding. These kind of things are actual genuine symptoms that adversely impact on people's lives. And when I went looking at the literature for evidence that fibre could benefit these things, the, the, the diagnostic symptoms of basically constipation we use in the clinic, the data was absent. And instead, I found a beautiful experimental trial where they actually put people on different levels of fibre in their diets. They had subjects who all had idiopathic constipation. So idiopathic, uh, if you're not medically trained, so idio means idiot and <laughs> pathic means pathetic. So it's just the diagnose, diagnostic label a doctor gives to something when we don't understand it. So uh, it's more a reflection on the doctor who'll give the diagnosis because it, it's basically idiopathic means I don't understand it and I really have no intention of trying to find out. <laughs> but anyway, so these people had constipation, idiopathic constipation, uh, and they were all on, you know, you know, moderately high fibre diets. So then a bunch of them were placed on even higher fibre diets and across five domains, their symptoms all got worse. Then some of them were put on low fibre diets and their symptoms across the board generally improved. And then a group of them, the largest cohort, were placed on zero fibre diets. And in every case, all symptoms of constipation were completely eliminated. And to date, in terms of looking at symptoms of constipation, not fecal transit rate or mass or any of these, you know, surrogate markers, which don't mean anything to the real patient, not the patients that I'm seeing, but the real things like pain and bloating, uh, a zero fiber diet was hugely, hugely successful. So this was a case where I'm sort of writing a textbook chapter and I'm sort of thinking, wow, my, my understanding is completely been thrown on its end. So I, I had a choice. I could either ignore the science and just, you know, not open myself to any criticism and write it as, uh, as I was writing it. Or I could say, well, no, I've just got to call it the way I see it. I, I've got to be, you know, it's an academic textbook. I have to be a bit scientific. Let's open myself up to some, uh, potentially up in some criticism, but that's unfortunate, you know, that's what, that's what the public expects us to do. I know you and I have talked about this before. I actually did two colorectal surgery rotations as a junior doctor. The patients there actually taught me a lot. Mm. And the interesting thing was looking at colostomy bags. And the patients were smarter than the doctors because that figured out that if they just had low residue foods, you know, meats and things like that, that don't contain any fiber, then their bag, when it came to getting changed, it might have a little bit of fluid in it, but it had very, very little fecal matter because everything they were eating was able to be digested and assimilated into their body. Whereas the fiber, and these could be, if you, if they had a lot of vegetable matter, fruits and vegetables, then their bag would be overflowing. And this is really speaks to the lie where you have these uh, activists who say, oh, don't eat meat, it will putrefy in your stomach. And the exact opposite is true. Mm. So putrefaction, um, basically rotting under the action of bacteria, that's what fibre does. That's what foods that are non-maldigested do. If you're consuming something like meat and you've got a hyperacidic stomach that can help break it down and you absorb it all, then there's going to be very, very little residue that will come out of your gastrointestinal tract. And a lot of people, when they go to a meat-heavy diet, report to me, I've, I've just got incredibly little amount of fecal matter, a very little fecal bulk. And so people on a low residue diet, they have much more pleasant experience changing their colostomy bags. Yeah. And that, um, that was something I saw as well. There was a study a while ago, they were looking at protein absorption um, from different, different uh, sources, so plant sources and, and animal sources. And they found that like 
by studying people with colostomies, they feed them different things and they just study the contents of the colostomy bag. Uh, very little of the of the animal-based protein was actually getting into the colostomy bag or quite a large proportion of the you know plant proteins yeah. getting in there as well. And that, yeah, I have seen that study. And uh, it, it's interesting that when you tweet something like that out, you get a lot of haters. So I read a paper that was promoting uh, insect protein recently. So yeah. all pathogens and these things aside, which is going to be a huge problem to overcome, um, they were actually comparing... Uh, insect protein favorably saying it's just as well absorbed as plant proteins oh just it wow and i'm Amazing. it was fantastic i'm saying well you know if you set the bar low enough yeah. <laughs> anything looks good right we say yeah. protein i mean I, I guess when i'm talk about protein yeah. food and i think we miss a trick i think we need to be doing what nina ty schultz is saying and not talking mm. about foods as proteins or not because whenever you have a food that's naturally high in protein, it's also naturally high in nutrients. We're talking about the micronutrients. Yeah. So yes. your, your, your vitamins and minerals. Yeah. And uh, so basically, if you've got a piece of meat, any natural food that's high in protein is largely also going to be quite high in, uh, you know, it's going to be good for you. We were taught in medical school that a healthy adult should have five years of B12 stores within the liver. So mm. you've got a, a long, a large reservoir of that and you can go for a long time on a, a B12 mm. deficient diet before you'll actually uh, become sick with the symptoms of B12 deficiency. So 